Welcome to Pro Practice, your guide to piano mastery. I'm Josh Wright, and today's episode is the second video in the Pro Practice Guest Artist Series, an initiative I recently started where I hired pianists and teachers from around the world to give a guest tutorial to include in the Pro Practice Library. And there are several reasons I wanted to start this. First and foremost, to expand the library uh, to be as big as possible, as quickly as possible, so that we have more content to share with each of you to help you in your studies. The second reason was to give you new perspectives and practice methods and ways of thinking about music that I may not have covered on my channel because every teacher teaches things a little bit differently and I'm a big proponent of getting different perspectives in your piano studies because it's always nice to think about things in a different way. Uh, today, I am so pleased and honored to present my good friend and colleague, Dr. Paul Wirth. We met uh, in 2019 in October at the Steinway Teacher Awards back in New York, and he is one of the most kind, amazing individuals I've actually ever met. He is one of the warmest people you'll ever meet, and that will be very uh, apparent in this guest tutorial, where he is going to be teaching us about Schumann's Aufschwung from Fantasy Stück. I wrote a few things down just so I didn't forget anything. Dr. Paul Wirth um, received his doctorate in piano performance from Indiana University under Sidney and Bronja Foster. I hope Hope I'm saying those names right. Uh, he created a pre-college advanced piano community in Minnesota with his Worth Center for the Performing Arts, where well-known young pianists like Reed Tetzloff, Evren Ozel, and Keith Kirchhoff, and so many others were taught, and where his Young Artist Piano Camp became a national summer hub for young artist pianists to gather and inspire each other for over 30 years now. And in fact, I I'm so honored to be the guest artist at this year's camp, July 15th through 31st. So I'll have more information on that as it gets a bit closer, but I'm really excited for that. Um, this tutorial was so entertaining to watch, so informative, and he really gets down on a very basic level, uh, not intimidating in the least bit. Sometimes when you hear teachers teach, you're like, oh geez, what did they mean by that? And I can... 100% guarantee you, you're not gonna have any questions. He doesn't leave anything unanswered. It is so clear cut, straightforward. And without further ado, here is Dr. Paul Wirth presenting Schumann's Aufschwung from Fantasy Stück. Hi everyone, I'm Paul Wirth, in for Dr. Josh Wright. And I just want to thank Dr. Wright for inviting me to do this guest tutorial on this YouTube channel. You know, the piano playing insights given in these pro practice episodes have helped thousands of pianists over the years. So it's an honor for me to join in on this episode exploring Robert Schumann's exciting piece, Aufschwung, or literally translated, Upswing, the second of his eight fantasy pieces, Opus 12. As a little bit of background, Aufschwung was composed in 1837 when Schumann was just 27 years old and Chopin, Mendelssohn, and Liszt, all close contemporaries, were also composing some of their amazing piano works. Schumann's own compositions, greatly influenced by his voluminous knowledge of literature, may be the most well-read of any composer of all time. His compositions were actually self-identified as representing basically two sides of his personality. The passionate, driving, and impetuous extrovert whom he called Floristan, and the dreamy, reflective, and passive introvert, whom he called Eusebius. And these two characters, as well as others, pervade all of his piano writing, including these fantasy pieces. He was a true romantic, and a prime example of the romantic integration of the arts. One other thing is that the late 1830s was also a time of great turmoil for Schumann personally, as he fought for the right to court his future wife, the great pianist and eventual editor of his piano works, Clara Wieck Schumann. And it turned out to be one of the most celebrated and iconic musical marriages and love stories of the entire 19th century. So, in preparing for this talk today, I used the original Breitkopf and Hertel publication from 1838, available on IMSLP, Clara's own edition from 1879, which is also very worth consulting, especially on account of the pedaling, and the Henle from 1986, which relied on multiple sources. Now, 
Schumann's Aufschwung is an exciting piece to be sure, and certainly fits the upswing, upsurge, soaring translations of its title. Starting right off with a driving sweep of emotion pretty much erupting from Schumann's impetuous inner necessity. In other words, Floristan personified. Almost volcanic in a way, beginning there with the first three notes forte and in a melodic upswing progression before coming back down, followed by upward two octave leaps in the left hand, which in the next iteration, the right hand extends then even higher, four octaves in fact. And then after coming back down, ending with an up skip of a fourth and an up step of a second. Quite on the up and up, as they say, emotionally hot and a technically challenging piece, especially for smaller hands. So I'd like to begin by addressing first the technical aspects in playing Aufschwung before focusing on the musical. And of course, there'll be some overlap. So the first challenge we face in this piece, as I said, is hand size, apparently requiring the stretch of a tenth, as the melody looks to be all in the downstemmed alto notes of the right hand. Very stretchy indeed. But fortunately, there are ways around this for those of us who can't reach a tenth. And even though I personally can, I still avoid it by taking the more stretchy right hand notes into the left hand, which we call redistribution, and it also provides for more powerful dynamic command. So, the first six bottom notes are played then in the left hand, continuing then in the right hand, and then only the B flat in the left hand, so it can get all the way down to that C octave in the bass, now, there are some that recommend playing B flat and C in the left hand, but at full tempo, it's very risky to get down there accurately. Oh, well, lucky me. <laughs> so playing the C in the right hand is recommended, yet it does require the right hand to play a minor ninth. Continuing then, the next three in the left hand as before, and finishing up in the right hand. Now, because Aufschwung is in A, B, A, C, A, B, A, rondo form, this A theme comes back quite a lot. And using redistribution like this works really well most times it returns. Now, another technical issue here is voicing, bringing out of the texture what we mostly want to hear, sculpting out the melody, which is easy enough when the left hand has the melody and the right hand the accompaniment above. Yet we still need to hear mostly the melody when the right hand takes up both. And to master playing the melody stronger than the other notes in one hand, as I just did, we use what I call issimo practice. Issimo practice, playing the melodic tones mezzo fortissimo and legatissimo, while at the same time repeating the upper notes pianissimo and staccatissimo. Eventually, leaving out the repeats in the upper two voices. While maintaining that dynamic difference. Of course, this can also be practiced as is, but very slowly to control the voicing. Voicing, a skill we need in all our piano playing. And we'll be talking about the shaping, pacing, and pedaling later when we go through focusing on musical issues. By the way, you may have already noticed that the fingerings I'm using might be different than those you might have chosen at first. We have a motto in our studio, fingering is everything. And if you're interested in having the fingerings I use in this piece, there will be a link at the end of the video. 
The next section, the B section, especially needs lots of voicing with the top voice initially being pretty much the most prominent for eight measures. Again, Isimo practice is quite valuable here. Practicing the alto sixteenths pianissimo and staccatissimo. And because the first three eighth notes in the melody are here are really, they belong musically to the next quarter note, you can also pick up your hand just before them to help with that. Lift. To that. To that, but not here and so forth. After all of which, it's just an easy step again to change the alto to the required legato, but now playing the 16th ever so softly. With voicing underway then, we can consider the technical issues of building speed and evenness. And for both speed and evenness, you might like to try a three-point system I've found very helpful with my students. The first part of which, speed, has to do with another principle, we have so many principles, in our studio, the thing you do is the thing you learn. You know, when I first heard that in Dr. Leon Foch's Psychology of Music class at Indiana University back in the Stone Age, I thought, duh, right? But now, it's a very important part of what we do and of building tempo in a piece. The fact is, playing fast is often a different technique than playing slowly. So those folks who start slowly and gradually speed up their piece with a metronome might be missing something. For example, with walking and running, they're two different techniques, right? With walking, your feet are always in touch with the ground, but with running, they're mostly off the ground. So speeding up slow playing would be like walking faster and faster and expecting to achieve a speed as fast as real running would be. Again, they're two different techniques. So I ask my kids, can you do this? <laughs> well, if you can do this, then you can play fast. Maybe not evenly yet, but fast. So we set the metronome at a full tempo here of a quarter note equals 104 for this section, which I'll talk about later. And very softly at first play a short segment telling our fingers, this is how fast I expect you to play. In this case, seven notes, and being sure to wait at least three ticks in between each iteration to think. Think, think. Let go of your shoulders. Then the next seven. and so forth, then you can do 13 notes at a time. It's mentally very intense work because you have to think about how to improve with each iteration. So you can only do it, well, I can only do it for maybe three or four lines at a time. But the thing you are doing is the thing you are learning to play fast. And then for evenness, as well as speed. The second part of the system. You know, practice rhythms are an old and extremely valuable friend. With the metronome at 126, we can do long, short long, short long. And the sister rhythm, short long, Short long. I call these the magic rhythms because of my former student, Matthew. A while back, Matthew was learning Beethoven's rondo, Rage Over a Lost Penny, you know, this, um, with all these fast running 16ths and so forth. And it wasn't going so well, so I told him that in order to speed it up, he needed to throw the kitchen sink at the piece. 
you know, like measure reps, in tempo, under tempo, all the practice rhythms, hands alone, etc., and so forth. Well, long story short, the next lesson he came in, and I mean, it was vastly improved. So I asked him, did you do the measure reps? He said, no. Did you do the hands alone? No. Well, did you do practice rhythms like long, short, 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 long? No. Well, how about short, 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 long? No. Well, what did you do, I asked. He said, long, short, long, and short, long, short, long. I said, that's it? Nothing else and it improved this much? He said, yeah. Well, I said, from now on, I'm going to call these the magic rhythms. And when you think about it, am I practicing slowly? Yes. With all that time in between to think about the mechanics like straight line fingertips, letting go of unused muscles, and am I practicing fast? Also affirmative. <laughs> in little spurts and lots of times to think in between. So, magic rhythms, so much is accomplished with them. That's not to dismiss, though, the value of the other rhythms. Like with the metronome at 160, we can do short, 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 long, long, short, 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 long, long. And long, short, 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 short. And the third part of the system, believe it or not, is the proverbial bump up, which I just dissed a moment ago, LOL. But the difference is we've already been fast in little spurts with short segments and with practice rhythms. So we can start the whole B section, for example, quite a bit under tempo, like about 50 beats on per minute under tempo at 54. Mm -hmm and play as beautifully as we can the whole section. And so forth. And with each three perfect iterations of that section, we can bump it up 10 beats per minute faster to 64, and with another three perfect, 10 more, and so forth, until we're at full tempo, and that'll take a number of days. So that's the system. Short segments in full tempo, practice rhythms, and the bump up. Going further then,